Hi everybody, this is the second installment in a series of mesh fusion tutorials based on my BumbleBot model. Uh, this one focuses on the main components of the bot's head. Uh, the head consists of several fusion items and some simple uh, non-fusion meshes. Uh, for this video, I'll focus on the main fusion item and uh, also on this bracket that uh, fits on the back of the head. The proboscis and its mount are separate fusion items, so let's go ahead and hide those. Uh, and as I say, we'll look at the bracket later, but for now I'll hide it, uh, along with the non-fusion meshes. And that leaves us with the main head fusion item. As in the first BumbleBot video, I won't spend much time showing uh, the very trivial, uh, mundane sorts of traditional mesh modeling that uh, goes into the source meshes. Uh, rather, I want to focus on fusion methods and techniques. So please forgive the fact that the source meshes appear uh, sort of prefabricated. And uh, note that when actually working on the model, uh, quite often the reshaping of these meshes uh, takes place after they have been fused. And you won't see much of that uh, happening in this video. So, okay, so um, the head shape comes from the intersection of two simple primitives. And here are those two mesh primitives. Um, they are just uh, slightly reshaped versions of a couple of cubics. Um, I shaped this smaller mesh using simple linear falloff scaling, and it's essentially the head shape I wanted, uh, but I knew that an intersection would provide uh, some crisp edges, some delineation, and just a more interesting form overall. So I thought I'd trim off the back of the head uh, to kind of flatten it, and uh, I'll do that by intersecting uh, the meshes. I'm going with schematic fusion in this case uh, because it will help when integrating the multiple fusion items that will make up the head. As always, I'd suggest starting with narrow strips and low uh, strip smoothing setting. Uh, this makes modeling faster and more robust and avoids the problems that can occur with overlapping strips. And note that these settings that you make in the new fusion form are remembered between Moto sessions. So once they are set, uh, you won't need to worry about them. All right then, um, here's what uh, that intersection gives us. Um, as usual, I played around with uh, position and reshaping until I was happy with the form. Um, and you know, often I'll discover something quite different from what I had in mind uh, when I first set up the primitives, but in this case, the original idea uh, sort of held up. Switching to the schematic fusion tab, uh, we see the simple schematic. Some of this item's surfaces will be shared with uh, other fusion items that form the head, so it's handy to work in the schematic fusion mode. By the way, it's easy to remove unused channels from the schematic using the Clear Extra Mesh Channels item in the Fusion Pie menu. As is typical with a simple fusion item, the schematic generated has more nodes than are really needed. Uh, with things like uh, single meshes attached to uh, union and intersection nodes. However, I'm not going to simplify the schematic just yet. Um, I will be adding more meshes and those nodes will likely come in handy. And since I forgot to name the fusion item in the new fusion form, I'll do that now. Note that renaming the item in the item list also takes care of the schematic node name, but does not update uh, the schematic workspace name. So I'll do that as well. Okay, so next I'll add the eye mount. Um, it's a simple spool-like mesh. I could use drag and drop, uh, but I've kind of gotten used to using the prep and add selected item in the Fusion Pie menu. Um, it adds the required channels and tags to a mesh and places it in the schematic workspace without linking it to any node. Since we don't want this new mesh to be trimmed by the intersecting mesh, uh, we want to add it as a new union. Uh, this is the equivalent of the drag and drop new branch with union option. And uh, for that, uh, we need a new union node. And that's easy to add with the Fusion Pi. So I'll connect the result of our original intersection and our new mesh to that union node. And the output of that union node connects to the fusion item. And with that in place, essentially what you have is a simple 
two branch schematic structure with the original intersection of two meshes forming one branch and the single um, eye mount forming the second branch. Again, there's really more to this schematic than there needs to be, but uh, it's likely that that structure will come in handy later, so I'm going to leave things as they are for now. And naturally, as you see, uh, you know, you can move any newly attached mesh around and change its uh, Boolean interaction after it's wired up to the schematic. The next mesh element consists of a couple of ordinary cylinders. Uh, they suggest a, some sort of mandible structure. And like the eye mount, we don't want them trimmed by the previous intersection. So uh, in this case, we can uh, simply prepare the mesh and uh, attach it to the same union node as the eye mount. Just like before, we use um, prep and add selected meshes from the Fusion Pi menu and then just wire that up to the same union node that the um, eye mount was uh, connected to. All right, uh, so again, to uh, save time in this video, I have the eye sphere already sized and aligned to the eye mount. Um, and uh, these spheres will be separate non-fusion meshes. However, I do want matching cavities in the head. Um, so I will duplicate the eye mesh and uh, note that both eyes are a single mesh here and use that duplicate to carve out the cavities. Um, after renaming the duplicate mesh, I'm ready to add it to the schematic. So once again, using the Fusion Pi, we add the duplicate eyeballs to the schematic workspace. When I originally created this, I thought about cutting the cavity into the eye mount only and not cutting the underlying head geometry. So to do that, I detached the eye mount from the union node and created a new branch with just the eye mount and eyeball cutters. Uh, and note this is being done with a negated intersection, which is the equivalent of a subtraction. I usually use uh, negated intersections rather than using the subtraction uh, node, uh, simply because uh, negated unions are more flexible. So next, I take the result of that intersection and link it back to the union node. And so then the uh, trimmed eye mount is back in place. I wanted a visible gap between the eyeballs and the sockets. So I'll use a deform push to enlarge the sockets. In this particular case, scaling would have worked just as well. Uh, but I'm just in the habit of using the deform push tool uh, to expand meshes uh, for cases like this because it works regardless of the shape. Um, scaling will only yield uh, consistent gaps uh, with a limited number of geometries like uh, cubes and spheres, for example. Okay, so I ultimately decided that I wanted to have full sockets that cut all the way into the head geometry. And to accomplish that, I needed to move the eye cutter after the last union. That way the cut would be performed on the result of all previous operations. So here I am detaching the eye cutter, linking the eye mount directly to the union node, rearranging the nodes a bit uh, just so I have a better uh, visual indication of the order and flow of things, um, disconnecting the intersect node, disconnecting the union node from the fusion item because it will no longer be the last operation. Moving the intersection after that union, connecting the intersection node to the fusion item, and finally recreating the negated intersection by reattaching the eye cutter to the intersection node. That may have seemed a bit uh, tricky to follow, but as I further rearrange the schematic here, I think it becomes pretty clear that what we have done is just create a three-branch schematic as opposed to a two-branch um, with the original intersection, um, the union of the um, eye sockets and the mandible, and then finally the cut of the eye sockets uh, all the way through everything.
Next, I wanted to cut a hole through those mandible cylinders and all the way through the head. So again, um, using a simple, uh, slightly modified cubic, uh, I went ahead and did the fusion prep and uh, added the mesh to the workspace. And uh, attaching it to the same node as the eye cutter uh, naturally makes it cut through everything just like the eye cutters do. Um, of course, you can play with the position and shape of any cutter like this. Uh, in the end, with this one, I went with something quite simple uh, because the plan was to fill the hole with another mesh anyway. All right, um, that covers the uh, main head fusion item. So uh, now let's look at uh, the next fusion item, the bracket. Um, uh, it'll be a new fusion item that shares some geometry with the head. So I'll uh, bring in a cylinder. It will serve as the kind of mounting point for the neck when that eventually comes along. And I'll add a simple box that will become a bracket, uh, sort of like bracket-like bars that wrap partway around the head. Uh, the idea is to trim these primitives with the head mesh so they become a separate item that precisely fits the head. And here's the mesh we'll trim with. It's the one that is responsible for uh, the, back head, the back part of the head. So we can uh, make a new fusion item that's just a, a simple union of the cylinder and the box. Uh, as usual, for clarity, I'm creating a new workspace for this fusion item. The smart thing to do would be to name it at this point, that way the workspace would get that uh, new name, but I'll catch that later. And of course, the uh, narrow strip and low smoothing settings are still in place. All right, so there we have it, um, and I'll use an instance of the head mesh to perform the head matching cut into this new fusion item. Um, an instance is a good idea in this case um, because the cut will be very nearly identical to the head mesh, just very slightly bigger. So scaling the instance will be accurate enough. I'm using the instance and add selected meshes item from the fusion pie. Uh, it creates an instance, and then, much like the prep and add mesh option uh, that we used earlier, uh, it prepares the mesh, or the instance in this case, uh, prepares it for fusion, and then adds it to the workspace. Since we want to cut away the uh, head geometry from our bracket here, we attach the node with fusion feed negated. Remember, output negated intersections are the equivalent of subtractions. Looking closely, we can see that the meshes have indeed been trimmed to match the head. And hiding the head gives us a much clearer view. I'm going to expand the cutting uh, mesh instance a tiny bit so that we get an actual visual gap between the surfaces. Uh, note that once we add wider strips, it will create a stronger visual separation of any matched, <clears throat> of any matched surfaces like this and I will likely widen the strips in this area later. Uh, so we don't need to depend entirely on the cutter scaling to create a visible gap. All right, next we'll need another cutter, again based on the head mesh, and we'll need it to perform a second trim on the bracket so that the bracket elements are sandwiched between the two trimming surfaces, creating a flat bands that conform to the head's surface. This time, I'm going to duplicate the mesh rather than using an instance. I want the bracket bands to have a very uniform thickness, and scaling would not necessarily provide that. Instead, I'll be using a push deform moto tool, um, which requires that I have a separate mesh. Can't do that with an instance. So after duplicating, I use prep and add selected again. Um, and it is, of course, important that the duplicate be prepped. Otherwise, it would have a uh, fusion ID conflict with the original mesh. Um, you never want to just manually duplicate a mesh and then add it to the schematic because it won't be properly prepared. All right, so here I'm using push deform to expand th that uh, duplicated mesh. Zooming in, uh, we can see the width of the gap I'm creating. I could have wired up this outer cutter um, before uh, making this adjustment, but uh, 
The results would probably be weird because the outer tether is actually smaller than the inner tether at this point. So I wanted to give it a little depth before I wired it up. Once I wire the new mesh in, we can see the result. Um, notice that this time I used the regular fusion feed, not, not the negated, um, since this outer tether is a normal intersection. Naturally, I could further tweak the thickness uh, by continuing to use the push to form uh, once the mesh is wired up to the fusion item. All right, so again, this is that uh, sandwich technique with two nested surfaces defining a thin layer. Uh, any positive meshes that intersect that layer will create thin surfaces that hug the head. And that's what we'll do next with this L-shaped box. Uh, it was created with a simple bend to form of a box mesh. Once again, I use prep and add selected to get it ready, uh, and then add it to the union of positive meshes in the schematic. Uh, you'll notice that the bands formed by this new mesh just kind of come to an end up here at the top. And that's simply where the box mesh runs out. Uh, the bands don't conform to the top of the head uh, because the sandwich we created is formed with copies of only one of the meshes responsible for the actual shape of the head. Uh, to match the shape better, uh, we need to incorporate the other main head mesh. Um, I'll hide the bracket for a moment and locate that other head mesh and drag it to the schematic. Since that second head mesh is already part of another fusion item, uh, we don't need to prep it. You'll notice the yellow highlighted node connector. Uh, that indicates an unshown connection to the main head schematic. This is a mesh that will be shared by two fusion items. And it's uh, no problem, nodes for a single item uh, can exist in multiple schematic workspaces. So uh, the idea here is to alter the inner cutter of our sandwich uh, to match the true shape of the head. And to do that, we need an intersection node. The fusion pie is the uh, easiest way to add that node and an intersection of our inner cutter mesh with this new mesh we just brought in creates the actual inner cut that we want. We can see that clearly by deconstructing and reconstructing the schematic. With both cutters removed, we see just the union of the three positive meshes. Disconnecting those and connecting only the inner cutter we just created shows us the new shape of that cutter. So let's wire it all up. First, the positive union and an intersection with the outer cutter. It's a good idea to wire things in stages like this so that you can verify the results. As opposed to say, you know, wiring up all of the meshes and operation nodes and then finally connecting that to the fusion item as the last move. Okay, so um, we want to subtract our reworked inner cutter uh, from what we see here. A subtraction node is the best way to go. So we have the results of the positives and the outer cutter going into the input A slot of the subtractive node, and the result of our new inner cutter uh, going into input B. Bringing the head back, we see the new improved fit. And I'll take a second now to rename the bracket fusion item. Wish I'd remember to do that when I create the new fusion items. Uh, that would save some steps. Uh, so anyway, um, we could go further and make this outer trim follow the head. Uh, but when I saw this ridge that was formed, I thought it was a nice feature and uh, figured I could use it to attach antennae uh, later. So I left it as is. All right, so there are some more fusion items and non-fusion items needed to complete this head, but I'm going to uh, leave it here for this video and uh, pick it up there with the next one. All right, thanks.